Jimmy Pettis, our own Jimmy Pettis. The man has been a mo member here at, at the Homewood since 1974. He knows all your names. Okay. Uh, he also, from 59 to 71, was in the Army in Vietnam in a very serious combat role. He was a draftsman. <laughs> and he survived. But yeah. he did survive. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, 40 years this year, senior project manager, works at Brassfield and Gorey. 29th year there. The, his wife, the beautiful, the saintly, <laughs> Donna Pettis. Did Donna come this morning? Okay. She's here. Every now and then, wives do not show up when their husbands speak. Okay. Children, have children. Matthew and Bethany. Some of you know Bethany. Bethany's here too. All right. Oh, what a family. Okay. Five grandchildren. <coughs> Five grandchildren. One on the way. And one on, wow. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. 1995, this is serious. Elected as Construction Project Manager of the Year for the state of Alabama by the Subcontractors Association. That's pretty cool. All right. All right. Now. Yeah, it's fun. The man <coughs> is a fisherman. He loves to fish. It's phenomenal how much he loves to fish. Help me welcome a man who gave up playing or fishing in the Bass Masters Classic this weekend and gave up the possibility of winning a $300,000 first place prize, Jimmy Pettis. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. I have uh, had the pleasure of commandeering Professor Baggett to help me out this morning. So, Professor, Professor, we have some like interests, do we not? Would you mind showing our class our like interests? Yes. What we have in common is we are. Uh, both have in common the uh, Homewood Church here. Uh, we have in common uh, something here. <laughs> and then we have in common our. Uh, That's the one I like. <laughs> and just to give you just a, a little history about uh, what Jimmy likes and what I like. A lot of people have asked me about my cars, so I thought I brought them to the <laughs> This is not a joke. Those are the, my cars in my yard. These are my son's cars in my yard. These are my son's friend's cars. These are my friend's cars. And then that's Jimmy's car. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, that's what we have in common. Today's lesson, Church Construction 101. A.B., let's go to the text. Would you read that for us, A.B.? Yeah. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Okay. Just a little bit of uh, prelude to the Sermon on the Mount. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, in Matthew 4, Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in a synagogue, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And his fame spread, and so he gave us, his disciples, two chapters, chapter 5, chapter 6, and the end of chapter 7. He summed it up, okay? Now, in construction and in building, how important it is to build on the rock, to build a solid foundation. And 
you know, I can't tell you how much money it costs for an owner when we build them a building to build a foundation for that building. It costs, it's very expensive. Um, and Jesus used the construction principles of today in his end of his sermon so the people could relate to that. The buildings that they had built during his time and they could relate to that. All right. I want to talk a little bit about this room. The room that you're in. Okay? Let me get my marker here. Now we're all feel very safe in this room, do we not? We're reading our Bibles, Cliff drinking coffee. Everybody's very comfortable. This building was constructed about 27 years ago. And in this room, there's four columns. One, two, three, four. By my calculations, the structural integrity or structural weight that's on those four columns is approximately what we call dead load. Two hundred and forty thousand pounds. Now, when you add the live load to it, like uh, the ice storm that we had a few few weeks ago, you put the live load on it that's designed into this building. You put another eighty thousand pounds. Okay, so at any given time, on those four columns. It could be 320,000 pounds of weight. That's equivalent to 80,000 pounds on each column. You still feel safe? <laughs> That's right over the top of your head. That's what those four columns are holding up. Been here 27 years. Okay. Now, underneath those columns... There's a concrete footing, four by four, by one foot thick, okay? And underneath that, there's 16 square foot of earth created by the God of heaven, holding up 80,000 pounds at any given time, right above your head. Now, along that column line, there is a steel angle, and if you walk right outside that building and look back, there's a brick wall right above your head, <clears throat> okay? And on that brick wall, there's 4,000 brick, okay? I need a volunteer. Donnie? <laughs> no, that here, you. <laughs> now, how do you relate to those numbers? Okay. How how do you relate to the weight of those numbers? Nobody got up and left the room, so I guess everybody feels pretty good, what right? About the okay. <laughs> Come here. I have a low. I have a Lowe's bucket, and in that bucket, there are 13 brick, and in that wall, there's 4,000 brick, 4,000. Would you mind picking that up? <laughs> <laughs> I hold it out like that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay. Hey, you get the idea? You get the idea? That steel angle. <laughs> that steel angle that holds that brick up. Here's a little piece of steel. I guarantee you there's not anybody in this room, not even Jim West, that can bend it. 
And that's what's holding that brick up. Okay? Now, I wanted to show you that so you could get some kind of comparison of the numbers when you look at that right there. And I know that 16 square feet of earth is holding up the weight of this building. Okay? Now, as uh, Russ mentioned, I was here on opening day. Brother West was, and maybe several other people, when we opened the building, okay? The very first day that we came into this classroom. What if, you pretend this is opening day, okay? The very first day, everything's brand new. Right before the class starts, let's say a guy stands up and he says, I'm the contractor that built this building. And before you have the class, I just want you to know one thing. That we didn't have enough money to put that steel angle up there, so we just set all that brick on a few pieces of plywood. <laughs> or we didn't have enough money to get the, all the proper earth out so that the bearing would be on those columns, so we just, there was some mud there, so we just poured that concrete on mud. What would you think? I know what I'd do, I'd run out the door and I would call him a fool, wouldn't you? Okay. Now the construction principles that Jesus used, what did he tell us? I would liken him to a wise man who builds his house on a rock who does my sakes. Here, and then what did he say about the foolish man? Think about what he said, okay? A.B., would you show us the pictures? Yeah, uh, Jimmy said, would, uh, could, could we find some pictures of what maybe the crowd that uh, would be associated with Jesus? And I found this uh, where a man had built a Jerusalem, a scale model Jerusalem, like an architect would build when they're building a model. And so, uh, here would be a picture of the temple, and um, this is a picture, on the left is a picture of his scale model of what he built, and I'll show you some others in just a second, but on the right is actually the, uh, the what's left of some of the temple wall, real temple wall, and so when Jesus is talking about brick and stone and the buildings, Here's some of the things that the people would be familiar with that saw that. Now, that was Herod's temple there in Jerusalem at that time. So this is what they were associating his uh, metaphors, what he was referring to. And then here was the pools at Bethsaida. And um, look how big, I mean, how gigantic these places are. This is a 150 scale of this and it's right now it's housed at the Israel Museum and then this would be a theater there that was in Jerusalem and then finally this would just be the city so when he talked about these people building their houses you know on rock probably you know in Nazareth him his being a carpenter you know he was very familiar with what he was talking about and so uh, that's just some of the architecture that his constituents would know about when he was talking about that. Okay. One of the things I wanted to, to point out to you, <clears throat> you can see the size of those stones and how much they weigh. I can't even imagine how they built those buildings and how they moved those stones. I, I have no earthly idea. I know what it takes today to do it. The <laughs> equipment that it takes today to build something even close to being like that. In my mind, they had to manhandle all those stones, okay? How they did it, who knows? But you can understand from the weight and the emphasis that Jesus is placing on building on the rock and a solid foundation for your life, why and what he says and the way he, we should be doing that. Okay, uh, A.B., let's, let's go to Matthew 16, and this time... We're moving on through the Bible, 
Okay. This time in the book of Matthew, we go to 16. Nebi, would you read that for us, please? When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I, say, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Okay. Now again, Jesus uses the word rock. And he uses that for the foundation of the church. And the foundation of the church is based on what Peter said, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the other verse he talks about the, all of his sayings on the Sermon on the Mount. Here he talks about his name. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and, and Jesus says he will, build, he will be the master builder. He will construct and build his church on that rock. His name. Now, <clears throat> when, uh, when we build a building, and I built a lot of buildings, I've probably been involved in at least 20 different church buildings around the Birmingham area. And the most wonderful day is finishing up. And for me, the most wonderful day is to handing the owner the keys and saying, bye. I'm through. And here's my final bill, okay? Now, in today's world, we have what we call, in, in every, bu every building I've ever built has had, of course, doors, exterior doors, egress doors. <clears throat> egress doors that have a lock, okay? And the way it works today is that you have a, uh, a hardware company who furnishes the keys and they give them directly to the owner. And I have what we call construction keys. So when we're building the church building or the education building, which is one I'm working on right now, we finish, we have construction keys which we're able to use during the construction process. The hardware company gives the uh, permanent keys direct to the owner. And he also gives them a change key. And that change key, we have a, what we call a keying ceremony, so to speak. And the owner will take his change key and stick it in the outside cylinders, doors, and he put it in that cylinder and turn it. And when he turns it, he changes it. And therefore, my construction keys will not work anymore. So I throw them away. Now the owner has his brand new keys, and he's the only one that has the keys, okay? So what did Peter, what did Jesus tell Peter that he was going to give him the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Okay, now, let's move on. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Jesus has his disciples gathered together again with him. And this time, it's a little bit different. This time, and A.B. doesn't have that on the screen, so you'll have to turn to Matthew 26. This time he tells them, this time he tells them about what's fixing to happen to him. And on that day, in that upper room, he tells them about the Lord's Supper. He institutes the Lord's Supper on that day. He talks to them about the bread. He talks to them about the fruit of the vine. And he tells them, in Matthew 26, he says, for this is my blood for the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sin. Now, I want you to understand what he said right there, and that is 
for many, for many, for the remission of sins. The change is about to happen. The change is getting close. So we know from reading on into Matthew 27, and we get to the, the crucifixion, we get to what he was talking about, and we get to the resurrection. We get to now Matthew 28. And in Matthew 28, Jesus says this. He tells his disciples that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The promises that Jesus gave us, the change at this point has been taking place. So, one thing that we talked about just a few minutes ago, is you remember uh, I talked about what would you do or what would I do if this builder that built this building changed the procedure or the construction materials unauthorized, okay? And that was just a makeup. Of course, that didn't happen. Now, when we get a set of construction documents, the documents to build a building by, I'm just a contractor, okay? The documents are signed and sealed by the architects and the engineers. The contractor is not allowed to make any changes whatsoever. If I make a change, I have to get it approved. If they don't approve it, we don't make the change. We build it based the building, based on the documents that we're given. Not only that, the building inspectors, the building code, people they will not allow us to make any changes. So we have no options. We have no options. Okay? When it comes to the spiritual life and following the words of Jesus, we don't have any options. We have to listen to His sayings and we have to implement the changes that He made in the spiritual world to our lives. We have no options. If we're going to follow Jesus, we have to listen to what he says. And we have to follow what he gave his disciples in chapter 28 of the book of Matthew. And if we turn over in the Bible and we flip to <coughs> Acts 2. In the second chapter of Acts, we read very clearly where Peter told the people of that day what the change was and what it would be. He told them where Jesus was and he told them about his name. He told them about his sayings in the Christian life. And they asked him, they asked him, what shall we do? And he gave them the answer. He gave them the answer. Because you see, Peter wasn't allowed to do anything but teach what Jesus told him to say in Matthew 28. Now, a few days ago, the Homewood Church sent this out. And I like it. Because the very first sentence says, here we have constructed a six-year vision. I like the word constructing. Okay? I like it. We have constructed a six-year vision emphasizing the restoration of all things. And it's actually a question they say why. And he talks about the 60 years of the history of this congregation. And, of course, I've been here 40 years. So I've been through the building program on Oxmoor Road, this building program when we bought the property, raised a million dollars in one day, and I've been through the building program here. Now, I didn't build this building, I didn't design it, but I was here 
and bent through all that process. Now I worked on it a little bit and I added an education wing on the back. Brent and I kind of put a new roof on and stopped the a little bit of water that was coming in. So we got that worked out. <laughs> but we talk about, in this letter we talk about living the Christian life as we read in Acts 1 through 8. And then the second part is giving. Giving. Now, in giving, we turn back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He talks about giving. And he says, do you want? Then you give. I mean, you have not because you ask not. And if we want, we have to give. And if we expect to live the Christian life like we want to live it and have Jesus in our lives, and we follow his teachings and we give, then what? We get more. So if we're going to get, we have to give. <clears throat> Russ asked me a while ago, he said, uh, you not, are you not a college graduate? And I said, no. No, I'm not. But I know how to build, and I've been working with Brassville and Glory for 29 years, and this is my last year. I'm going to retire this year. But anyway, I want everyone to understand one thing that I believe in this church. I believe in the elders and what they stand for and what we're teaching. Hey, B, would you go to the last? Now, in John 6, verse 63, Jesus makes this statement. It's the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. If, if anyone ever asks you a question, about what you're living, where you go to church, why you go there, or what you believe in, or what you do, or why do you do it, just turn on to here. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So when you look in the New Testament, we look in the book of Acts and the book of Matthew and the words that Jesus gave us that we live our lives by. That's where we want to take them. Because if, see, if we don't follow his word and his teaching, then what do we have? Mr. Russ, I'm through.